Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Anthropology Colloquium series on Sense, uh, where we, over the past few weeks, have been engaging with the question of why, what might an anthropology of and beyond the sensorium look like. For today's event, we look at time, affect, and capitalism, and have amongst us Professor Benjamin Lee. Welcome, Professor Lee. Uh, Professor Lee is Professor of Anthropology and Philosophy at the New School. He has also served as the Dean of the New School for Social Research and as Provost for the New School. Prior to joining the faculty at the New School, he was Professor of Anthropology and Asian Studies at Rice University, where he also directed the Transnational China Project at the James A. Baker Institute of Policy Studies. From 1999 to 2001, he was a visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong in the Department of Comparative Literature. Professor Lee was a founding director for the Center of Transca Transcultural Studies in Chicago and was a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. He holds a PhD in Anthropology and MA in Human Development from the University of Chicago and a BA in Psychology from Johns Hopkins University. His work includes books such as Talking Heads, Language, Metalanguage, and the Semiotics of Subjectivity, and the recent co-edited volume, Derivatives and the Wealth of Societies. Professor Lee has written extensively on the anthropology and philosophy of language, literary theory, and global cultural studies. His research interests include linguistics, philosophical and psychological anthropology, global cultural studies, and contemporary Chinese culture. We thank you, Professor Lee, for joining us today, and I pass the mic on to you. Okay. Uh, I can gather this is the first uh, in person, <laughs> so we can relax <laughs> and all that because we want to get used to uh, our new conditions you know, and things like that. Um, I want to mention uh, you can um, join this Zoom conference. Uh, for Lauren at the English Department of uh, uh, University of Chicago. Um, I actually know uh, Sian and Katie. Katie was a colleague of Greg. Um, and I, I will talk a little about Sian's work. Uh, in the, the gimmick is this huge hot book. And, both Lauren and Sian had New Yorker profiles uh, recently, so uh, they're certainly a, a form of a pair. And Sian actually uh, left uh, Stanford for uh, Chicago partially because of Lauren and stuff like that. Um, okay, so you can register on uh, this. Here and want to take it down because I'm going to change <laughs> the uh, poster to my talk. Okay. Okay. Let's see if I can do this right. Now, how do I do this? Okay. Okay. Some background. Okay. Um, uh, Lauren passed away in, in uh, early summer. And I was actually teaching a course um, on uh, capitalism and neoliberalism. And I was actually lecturing on um, Lauren's work. And uh, Lauren uh, passed away, as I said, in, in the early uh, summer. Michael just passed away about a year and a half ago, right? And Moish. Uh, about two and a half years ago. They were all at the University of Chicago, all right? Uh, that was their first appointment, so they didn't, didn't leave for anywhere else. They had maybe 30, 35 years of being colleagues, um, but they never collaborated. <laughs> uh, they had a lot of students, uh, graduate students, that took their classes and things like that. And they were all at the um, Center for Psychosocial Studies in Chicago. And Michael and Greg were the development of uh, the directors of the uh, linguistics section. Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner were uh, 
who's at Yale now, were the charge of the uh, literary section. And Moish and uh, Tom McCarthy were uh, in charge of the uh, social theory group. Uh, and you know, that, that kind of overlapping background, they were actually part of a, a larger um, project on the internationalization of culture and communication. And we actually read um, both, uh, we had a pre-publication uh, translation from Tom McCarthy of Paramas' Public Sphere book. And the second, I guess the second edition of Ben Anderson's uh, Imagine Community. And they were kind of like the focal point of that uh, discussion at that time, because in 1989 you had the fall of the you know Soviet Union, Ken Unmun, the first election uh, victory of the BJP, and we had a lot of uh, foreign uh, fellows at that center. And I remember uh, both Michael and Lauren actually being involved in that, especially uh, Michael's work on counterpublics things like that. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit of the background. Um, when I was teaching this uh, uh, material um, uh, the first time, uh, not, not just this summer, but a couple of years ago, Michael Warner actually uh, told me that Sian Nye had just given a lecture at Yale and had used Moish Postone's work that he knew about through the center. And so I immediately read uh, Sian's uh, gimmick. It was in um, uh, Critical Inquiry. And then I met him. I, I met her at Moish's Memorial Conference in Chicago. I mean, um, and we had a long uh, talk about uh, why she would move to Chicago and, and things like that. And I did discover later that this will be relevant um, for us, that uh, Sian was a student of uh, Barbara Johnson. Uh, Barbara Johnson was a very famous literary uh, uh, critic and professor at Harvard. Um, and she was the uh, uh, kind of prize student, along with Gayatri Spivak, of Paul the Man. Okay, uh, and it's actually more interesting than that. Lauren got her PhD in English literature, uh, where Paul the Man actually had founded the Conflict Department. And I think Gayatri was her, his first uh, PhD student. Uh, and the English department then, when Lauren was there, was actually a, a, one of the centers for uh, literary deconstructionist theory, along with Yale. Okay, so she really uh, imbued that material, uh, and I actually had a talk with her about uh, Barbara Johnson uh, 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 in New York City, and she said that she found that. Uh, the complaints that deconstructionism didn't have a politics uh, contravened by Barbara Johnson. Okay. Uh, and actually, the piece that I'm going to talk about uh, today, animation, apostrophe animation and abortion, is actually well, amazingly relevant uh, to the present moment. And I, I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So, as I said, these people never co collaborated, okay? Uh, they had lots of graduate students overlapping. And I want to start with a quote that actually is kind of the frame of the, uh, the presentation. Uh, you can read, read this quote. And uh, Lauren mentions Hara Haratunian and Moish Postone. Okay, basically as, um, uh, basically, uh, 
Marxists that don't quite make the turn to the present. Okay. Uh, and she actually in Cool Optimism says that cool optimism is a didactic. <laughs> and what does she mean by that? All right. Now, Haruka Tunian was a Japanese historian uh, that um, had a huge influence from Derrida and post-structuralist theory, and there are uh, a, a group of with uh, Tess Nagida, they were called Narratunians <laughs> at Chicago, Nagida and Narratunian, and they formed this very radical, at that time, uh, post-structuralist reading of, uh, of Japanese history. I mean, um, and uh, Narratunian was basically an advocate, an acolyte of Moish's interpretation of Marx. Because that's, that's what I want to do. But Lauren is saying there's a gap. And the gap is going to be between uh, Moishe's notion of historical time and um, Lauren's notion of the historical present. And I'm going to argue that what um, Lauren fills up that gap with is her account of rhetoric, especially apostrophe and free and direct style. Uh, uh, two areas that literary specialists certainly know about. They're less known in linguistic anthropology. So I'm going to try to make a bridge between linguistic semiotics, okay, and the stuff on that Barbara Johnson does on free direct style and apostrophe. But you have to remember that linguistic anthropology uh, at its Chicago version that Greg and I were trained in, we actually got the same linguistic background that literary deconstructionists had. So when you read Barbara Johnson, it's full of Jakobsen and Pompanese. I mean, uh, and most of that is forgotten now. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to try and revive that <laughs> a little bit. And I'm going to argue that there's an arc from uh, work on the wharf, which deals with grammatical analogy, all the way to the use of apostrophe and free and direct style, which Lauren said are the theoretical framework for cruel optimism. Okay, she actually says that in chapter one. So I'm going to ask, what is that? What, what, how do they function in this? And I'm going to argue, uh, and this, this is something that I came across probably over this weekend, as Greg knows. So I'm not, I'm not sure it's right. <laughs> but I'm actually going to argue that it continues on the level of tropology, what Paul the Man talked about in Allegory's reading as the tension between the rhetorization of grammar and the grammatization of rhetoric. All right, um, that's his reworking of Jakobsen's poetic function for tropes. Okay, so well, how am I going to do this? Okay, um, and what I want to argue is that I'm going to use a, a, usual, a usual um figure is Ben Anderson. Uh, and the reason is that I knew that um, Lauren uh, Berlant and, and Michael were very interested in Anderson. Because Anderson actually argues that um, uh, the, the forms of new subjectivities you needed for uh, what we call um, we call uh, stranger-mediated communities, imagined communities that make up nationalism. That is, in principle, 
your fellow citizens are people you don't know or, or uh, know face to face. And he said that these new affects like patriotism, dying for somebody you don't know, came from the novels, from realistic narration in novels and newspapers. Okay. And that's exactly a literary thesis. But he actually didn't explain exactly how that worked. So what I turn to Michael Silverstein in a, a very technical paper uh, um, that many of you saw uh, a calc of uh, in my paper. Um, I tried to explain what Michael was talking about. Um, but what he uh, does is interpret um, uh, Anderson in terms of uh, the um, semiotic linguistics of narration itself. And he uses a very interesting uh, analysis. He wants to use Worf, uh, Benjamin B. Worf, to analyze the fashion of speaking that we have in what is called standard average European, that is basically European languages, Romance and Germanic and to an extent, extent, extent Baltic languages. Uh, that, um, you know, how narration actually creates these new forms of subjectivity. Okay. And it actually comes from, a, a, a Bombadis was very, very uh, familiar with war. He actually wrote a book, uh, an article reviewing the war. So that all this material is kind of commonly available, both to the literary deconstructionists like Barbara Johnson and the literary semiana, linguistic semiotics. So that's why we're all sitting here today, is to try to see whether or not we can make some sense of it. Okay. Now, the, um, the thing that I struck me to make the link between Moish and Michael about time was Sian's uh, comment here. Um, that's in her um, uh, uh, article in Critical Inquiry, where she basically uses um, Moish's account of the gimmick, okay, um, as her theoretical framework, and this is the um, passage. This passage is the one that I actually uh, try to explicate in my classes. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it's a typical Moish sentence. Uh, uh, he got his PhD in, in Germany, in Frankfurt. And underneath uh, er Erin uh, Fetcher, who's a Hegelian Marxist. And he learned about what we call an imminent critique um, from Erin. Er and it's a very different uh, critique uh, and interpretation than standard Marxist interpretations, especially in the United States, uh, especially David Harvey, you know, for instance. Uh, and it comes from the uh, German reading Hegel. All right. And I'll talk a little bit about that because he's going to argue uh, and provide this notion of historical time as a dialectic between abstract and concrete labor time. Okay, and that dialectic is going to be responsible for the fetish <laughs> and a whole bunch of other things. It will become the frame in which Lauren will identify the historical present. But, he, but she says here that Moish can't get to it because he doesn't have affect. He doesn't understand indirection and attachment. And that's exactly what she says. The politics, the reason she goes to Barbara Johnson 
is that is an account of indirection. Indirection is just another word for rhetoric, right? So this is the uh, Sian's uh, explanation of the, uh, the treadmill effect in relative surplus value. Relative surplus value is, of course, Marx's account of innovation, technological innovation. It's denominated in abstract labor time. It's the number of hours necessary to produce a commodity. As um, Moish says, um, it's hours denominated in calendar time, in the abstract, homogeneous, empty time of Newton. All right. It's basically, if you think about our framework for time, our fashion of speaking about time, you have a, a component that's an infinitely divisible framework, OK, a timeline. All right, in which all events take place. You can give a date. But then there's another th fun funny thing about it. It flows from the future through the present to the past. The flow and Newtonian time, they don't go together. All right, and they actually have very different logical properties. All right, abstract, uh, homogeneous, as Newton said, absolute time right, is extensional. That means that the amount of time that an hour makes, uh, measures is the same thing as 60 minutes or 3,600 3, seconds. And it doesn't vary. All right. That's actually a, a historical development because hours used to vary according to the daylight in, uh, in, in uh, time, uh, in the seasons. So actually, um, Moish has a long section on the development of time reckoning in China and Europe. All right, it's very, very interesting. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty good summary of what the nature of that argument was uh, 15, 20 years ago. There's been a lot of research since then. Um, uh, I, I can talk about the Chinese stuff uh, uh, pretty, pretty well. But what you begin to get is varying hours becoming constant hours. And constant hours are because of the development of mechanic, me, mechanical clocks, all right, things like this. But constant hours are required for an extensional notion of time. And Newton's notion of an infinitely divisible timeline comes from his development of uh, calculus, the notion of an infinitesimal, all right? Basically, it's the notion of real numbers. But the problem with real numbers is that you can always find a point between real numbers. All right. So you need a very, very uh, uh, complex definition of the continuum as a, a, the backup a notion of an infinitesimal. So that the actual number, uh, the, the actual uh, development of real numbers, the definition, mathematical definition, doesn't come out until the 20th century in non-standard analysis. And I, I actually, it's a very funny story in China on Ma, Mao Chi's, uh, Newton's, um, uh, uh, Marx's, uh, uh, Chinese translation of Marx's writings on Newton. <laughs> and he gets fascinated with an infinitesimal. I'll talk a little bit about that. But the idea here of the treadmill is that the um, abstract labor of time 
abstract labor is denominated in abstract time as Newtonian hours and stuff like that. But it interacts with concrete labor time, which is a function of, of morning, according to Moish, of events. So it's the rise and setting of the sun, or things like this. So it's not extensional. It's known as intentional with an S, or indexable, <laughs> right? Purse's uh, idea of an event, uh, an indexical, is something that has a causal relationship with an event. <laughs> okay, the sign. One of them. Okay, so what you get in relative surplus value, and this is where the treadmill comes up, is that when you produce commodities, they're denominated in um, the value uh, is denominated in abstract time, but with the uh, innovations, you increase the efficiency of time uh, of labor, so that you produce more material wealth, concrete labor's production, right? But you decrease the amount of value in each commodity. And he argues that gives you that gives you a direction to time because you're always involved in, in an innovation-based capitalism by decreasing the value of labor and increasing material wealth. That's the trend. In other words, as you move forward, you're slipping backwards <laughs> at the same time. That's exactly the definition of pro-optimism. Right? Pro-optimism is having an attachment, let's say, to um, uh, the fruits of neoliberal uh, neo uh, neo capitalism, even though it prevents you from enjoying yourself in the present, flourishing in the present. So I saw in Zian's uh, given the structure that I needed. The treadmill was in cruel optimism. Well, Zian's book is a lot later than uh, in cruel optimism. How do you reconcile it? Okay. Well, if you read her book, and especially uh, the article's already there, she traces the gimmick back to the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, right? So all, all of a sudden you begin to hear a historical echo because neoliberalism grows in the 90s and ends maybe with the Great Recession in 2009. It's all the same time as Piketty's inequality in Europe and America, uh, the wealth of inequality begins to develop needs. It derives of finance, derivative finance. Okay. So there's clearly some kind of echo in that. And when you look at the uh, Sion's account of the gimmick, uh, in her article, she produces uh, Rube Goldberg drawings, these very intricate labor saving devices to gimmick, right? Uh, and then you realize that at the gimmick, it was a, a kind of a disparaging thing to say it's a gimmick, but it's also humorous. There's no cruel optimism in it. So the question is, what happens when the introduction of the gimmick, right, all the way to the neoliberalism of the 80s and 90s, and cruel optimism? Now, in chapter four, uh, Sian Nai actually analyzes It Follows. It Follows, uh, he 
she wants to argue that finance, the it follows, has um, the idea of uh, discounting to the present. Okay, that is, when you try to figure out a future price, you have to discount that future to the present, usually in terms of a risk-free interest rate. Okay, things like that. That's one of the things that derivatives are based on. Discounting to the present is actually uh, talked about by Harvey as a fetish <laughs> uh, in volume three. So my question, I remember that for some reason. Uh, it was actually a very interesting comment. And the reason is that Volume 3 isn't edited by Marx's hand. And Volume 1 is the one that Moish focuses on. So how, if it's possible that um, discounting to the present is a fetish that appears in Volume 3, that means that the fetish develops over time. So that the money fetish it's just a historically specific form of the fetish. All right. And I'll, we can talk a little bit about the evidence that Moish produces for that. It has to do with the editing from the Gurubrissa through the a contribution to a political economy to uh, volume one. There are a whole bunch of changes. And he wants to argue that Marx discovers, as he says, Hegel, and he writes volume one as an inversion of Hegel. And he actually says that in the second afterward of the German edition. I mean, Marx, Marx actually says that. You know. So that's what Moish's argument is, but then you have an interesting thing. If the money fetish means that you treat people as things, and that's true. The fetish is not false. It's true, but it's a partial vision. Then you can ask, what's the counterpart to the fetish in neoliberalism? And Foucault had an answer. Human capital. You treat people as human capital. You treat people as portfolios. All right. You have to manage your assets all right, as if they were portfolios to be maximized, but maximized in terms of return with a minimum of risk. That's portfolio theory. That's the core of portfolio theory, is maximize return and minimize risk. What Foucault says in his College of France lectures is that everybody follows Gary Becker in the overload, right? He actually probably got it wrong. And the reason is there's another Chicago school existent at the same time as Gary Becker that actually explains neoliberalism much better. It's all the Nobel Prize winners that develop derivative by finance, Black Scholes, Robert Merton at MIT, Eugene Fama, <laughs> who's still there. All these invent all modern finance. Harry Markowitz, portfolio theory, was a student of Milton Friedman. <laughs> Milton Friedman, at the same year that Black and Scholes published the pricing model for options, which is still used 50 years later to price options, trillions of dollars of options today, right? right. At that time, all these uh, theories um, come out. Then, at the same time, 1973, Chicago Options Exchange opens. 
uh, and then all of a sudden you see the explosion of derivative finance so that the notional value of derivatives is 10 times world GDP. Most of which takes after the uh, mid of the 80s. All right, so you can begin to see the link, all right, between neoliberalism and finance. All right. And what Moise is saying is the fetish that exists is exactly what Lauren is saying is the surface of our belief and attachment to the promises of neoliberalism. Return, return, return. All right, material wealth. But at the same time, the value of labor is going down. The labor that we put in to things is devaluing. That's the trend. Okay. okay. Any questions? I mean, this is already you know a lot of material. I'm going to go into now these fashions of speaking. Uh, be a little bit technical uh, because it's sort of linguistic semiotics and stuff like that. I, I guess I can also answer them these questions later on because I, I'm talking uh, in a couple of uh, sessions afterwards. All right. I give you the, the, the kind of general story and then we'll okay, sorry. I would very much appreciate if you could make the type big enough so we can see back here. Sorry? I would appreciate it if you could make the typeface on your oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, is that it? Excellent, thank you. Okay. Okay. I've already talked a little bit about this, okay? Um, the China past an hour is... <laughs> Moishe Moi actually wants to, to, to ground this historically. An imminent critique is a socially historically uh, specific critique, right? So it takes, uh, it basically criticizes any trans-historical notion of a concept applying from the outside. He actually talks about it as a kind of anthropology. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, but um, the problem that um, Moish uh, had was to try to say that, all right, once you have a historically specific uh, account what form will it take, all right? That the mode of analysis should reflect the object that it explains. So, for instance, if the object is dialectical, it should be a dialectical mode of analysis, all right? And, you know, the account that he, he gives is, um, based on the changes between um, the Grunerissa and Volume 1. I'll just mention a couple of them. The Grunerissa starts with a trans-historical discussion of production and consumption. All right, it, it's a discussion of production and consumption that will apply to any society. At the end, of the Grunerissa, there's a section on value. And he says, uh, Mark says, move it forward. It's this almost a repetition of the folly of the opening sentence in capital, which is a specification that bourgeois wealth in capitalism appears an immense collection of commodities, a socially historically specific uh, beginning. And what Moish begins to analyze 
is the structure of these works intermediate. The Grimrissa does not have any mention of the fetish. Right. And it doesn't have the money dialogue. There. Two years later, in a contribution to the critique of political economy, you have the money dialectic without the simple form, and you don't have the fetish. Ten years later, in volume one, it unfolds from the simple form. A contribution to critical economy begins with the same sentence as volume one. That is the sentence that had to be moved over to the front in the Gerber's. So that's Moshe's argument, that he's developing this notion of a fetish to explain why you think that people treat things, people as things, under a money, uh, capital, let's say, money-driven society, all right? But that's not the whole picture, because there's concrete labor underneath it. There's a dialectic between concrete. If you read only on the surface, you get everybody as prices and commodities. This actually has a really um, severe, uh, important consequence for Marxist historiography. Uh, Moish is sort of suggesting that the simple form of value, the expanded form of value, the general form of value, and the money form, the way you present them is a fetish itself. That's not historically accurate, as any anthropologist knows. Every, there's no historical evidence that money develops out of border. So Marxists are, have been split on this, whether or not it's a real account or, as Moish says, a fetish. Okay, I just leave that there. I mean, even if you add concrete labor and the labor uh, uh, dialectic and all that, it, it, it doesn't make sense historically or historically. I mean, so I, I just, you know, Anyway, this China constant hours, um, this is historical evidence. See, China developed constant hours, believe it or not, 3,000 years ago with water clocks. Right. And Joseph Needham says China never developed abstract absolute time until it turns to the West. So you have constant hours that are necessary for absolute time, but you never develop absolute time. Why is that? What's that story? What Moish want, wants to say is it's the development and use of mechanical clocks. And this mathematically precise notion of time intersecting with Newton. And he talk, uh, talks about this as a um, domination by absolute time. If you think about it, that value is denominated in absolute time, then actually the spread of capitalism depends upon the spread of Newtonian physics in precise engineering. The story in Asia is quite interesting. The Chinese developed the most accurate clock uh, for 500 years. It's the uh, picture in my poster. <laughs> Susum's uh, uh, water clock in 1100. It's the most accurate clock until humans 
develops a, a, a pendulum mechanism to things like this, and spring mechanisms in 1500, about 30 years before you. Okay. So all of a sudden you begin to see um, this idea that absolute time as an infinitely divisible timeline and things like that becomes more and more present all right, in the West. And it's partially to the development of mechanical clocks. So for instance, where um, mechanical clocks, let's say 1200, were only accurate to a couple of hours within a week, by 1830, they're accurate to one second in a week, pendulum clocks. We know these as grandfather clocks, <laughs> because they're imported into the domestic family, right? And they're known as regulators. They regulate the setting of other clocks and labor. And what happens, what Moishar is, is you develop um, in the West centralized time, like clock towers in the central uh, uh, squares and stuff like that. Think about it, railroad stations <laughs> with clocks. Um, and then you develop spring watches, the uh, spring mechanisms, balances for wrist watches. Wristwatches are first only sold to women. Men wear these pocket watches. When does that spread? It's soldiers to synchronize attacks. <laughs> right? That is the story in Asia. And this is what Moish is interesting about. China used uh, mechanical clocks. They were introduced by the Jesuits. And they became very popular. There are like 4,000 4, uh, mechanical clocks in the Imperial Palace collections and stuff like that. But they were basically considered decorative. They never regulated uh, everyday activities um, the way they did in the West which were always run by the solar lunar calendar, right? Um, these very precise water clocks were only used for ritual observations, astronomical calculations. So what happens? All right. It's actually an interesting story. China, Japan, and Korea, in the late the 19th century get in an arms war. They all are trying, <laughs> Japan and Korea are trying to invade China, and China is weak at the Qing dynasty. And the Japanese, you probably saw this, uh, they have blunderbusses. They have European imports of single fire rifles that have to be cleaned and all that. And they see rapid fire rifles. <laughs> and they said, oh, wow. So 1873, the Jap Japan adopts the Western calendar. 1895, Korea adopts it. 1911, the Chinese adopt it. Right? You can see what's happening. They begin to send out their students to learn engineering to learn precision engineering to make rapid fire rifles and machine guns and artillery. So you can see this whole transfer, transference of parts of manufacturing capitalism across the world. But then that reinforces Moish's notion that it's the, app, the domination of absolute time that has to be socialized. Okay. There's a recent uh, book by Jimena Canales, uh, K-A-C-A-N-N-A-L-E-S, 
uh, about the Bergson-Einstein debates in uh, 1921 in Paris. But uh, I'll talk about that later, or maybe in the questions. But she has this chapter on the League of Nations. And there are all these, League of Nations was evidently um, uh, basically supported by the French. And one of the reasons they supported it was um, the standardization of measurements. They already had lost on time because Greenwich time. They wanted the standard meter to be in Paris, where it still is. All right. You can see all these negotiations and, and things in the Canales book. And then it turns out that Einstein and Bergson represent two opposite theories of time. All right. One that is based on mathematics and extensional analysis and all that. Einstein and Newton. Both time uh, for Newton and Einstein are reversible. There's no pa uh, past, present, and future. Bergson had a theory of duration based upon the flow of the past, present, and future taken from, uh, according to Warp, from tense. Right. And, and Bergson is one of the founders, philosophical forefather, forefathers of affect theory. Bergson plays a huge role, for instance, in the Sumi's uh, calculations. So all this stuff <laughs> reverberates in many different models. OK. okay. So um, what's um, time, according to Silverstein? What I, I'm going to try and just um, Introduce um, Michael to a roundabout way. And then I have notice the time too. Um, Michael uh, uh, basically tries to show you the grammatical roots of our question of speaking about time. And as I said, if you just sort of put it together, there is an extensional portion, all right, that comes from. Uh, the infinitely divisible framework for all events. And another portion that comes from a tense, basically. Our experience of duration, past, present, and future. And the two systems are linked together by a set of, and this is very interesting, grammatical analogies. Count mass systems. Things like this. Okay, I, I think I can go over. Uh, it needs some diagrams and all that, uh, so I can talk about that if people want to uh, learn it uh, in, after the uh, you know, after the talk. So what he's saying is, is um, the Warfian grammatical categories. The reason they're so important is, one, the linguistic categories are the most used categories we have. They're also unconscious. Okay. And he actually says that our basic uh, conception of time cross-linguistically is probably something like becoming later and later. From that ever phenomenological experience, you have different grammatical systems pointing you in different directions. For instance, uh, Chinese that has no aspect system, and everything are compounds. <laughs> okay, no, no mass nouns. So it has a very different conception of time. <laughs> it's actually ritual and cyclical. It's much closer to the Hopi notion that, that war talks about. But they've got also this a whole metaphor about water. 
So that, that really makes it more complicated, okay? Uh, and water fits in with their flow model, all right, which is a very different model than decision making. We have both models, a flow model, Chicksamahali works and all of that. And we also have a decision making model. That's actually the dominant model because it fits into expected utility theory and game theory. And so you can see the development of decision making under uncertainty right out of these roots. I mean, so what we're going to look at uh, is with Silverstein, what we get is the grammatical foundations via analogy <laughs> all right, of our notions of time, which are two notions of time, the infinitely divisible framework right, in which all events take place, and the flow of time, duration as experience. And they come together, and they come together in count mass distinction, which is exemplified in words like two hours of time. Okay. Now, why is this important? Because they think of grammar as a certain system. It's not just two hours of time analyzing each word and its part of speech. It means that any word and any grammatical category is part of a system, which is why these grammatical analogies become so important. And for most of these historical linguists, structural linguists, all right, that's the only way that grammar changes, is through analogy. <laughs> you can see what's going on, right? If you want a, a notion of historical time, it has to be structural. Okay. What I'll talk about very quickly uh, is this fashion of speaking about subjectivity, which I have lots of material on. Um, this isn't something Michael talks about. But I want to argue that the uh, fashion of speaking about subjectivity interacts with our fashion of speaking about time. And the fashion of speaking about subjectivity is first given in um, direct and indirect discourse. So that's a standard argument. And sta uh, indirect and direct discourse have um, similar features across all European languages. You know, the use of subordinating conjunctions like das or si or if or that, you know, things like that. Um, okay, so you make one cup, grammatical cup, but there's another two levels of analysis that I want to talk about. Um, once you look at verbs of feeling, thinking, and speaking, you notice that uh, in direct discourse, they take these stat clauses. These are called nominalizations. And there are a lot of linguistic research about nominalizations ranging from perfect nominalization, nominals to imperfect nominals. The question is whether or not you're encoding a proposition or just an event or, or process. Once you have nominal complements like a that clause, you're basically encoding a, a sentence or a proposition. When you look at all the verbs of speaking and feeling and thinking that take nominal complements, sentential complements, and you cross them with that aspect, you get three categories. All right. You get mental activity verbs, mental state verbs and performatives, verbs of speaking. All right. Then when you look at the nominal complements they can take, you get um, uh, uh, Austin had a list of, of, of five, uh, six 
of uh, you know, categories of performatives. That all took different modelizations, expositives, behavitives, derivatives, and all this kind of stuff. Um, if you look at mental activity verbs and mental uh, uh, mental state verbs that are come out of your classification by asset, you discover that um, each category of nominal complement that you have performers also is repeated in mental activity and mental state verbs. So that almost everything that you can uh, say can be thought, and everything that you can think can be said. That doesn't work in many languages. <laughs> okay, the sort of identification of these, what Dwarf would have called cryptotypic categories. All right, all these kinds of uh, classifications that overlap in Cesorian proportionality. We're, we've actually talked about three of them direct and indirect discourse, aspect, and non nominalization. They form a big way of talking about subjectivity, representing speech and thought. They interact with our time system, the extensional portion and the uh, tense system to produce what I call decision-making models and full models. Okay. Lauren is a flow model, and she actually says that because she goes after decision-making models in her critique of uh, the Shield Learning there in Chapter 2. She goes uh, after Meme for this notion of sovereignty that relies upon performativity and decision making. Okay, last thing, and then uh, we can stop. Why free and direct stop in apostrophe? All right. In chapter one on cool optimism, Lauren says, uh, I'm actually going to use Barbara Johnson's stuff on apostrophe and free and direct stop um, uh, to actually be the keys to indirection that crew optimism depends upon. Right. Now, free and direct style and apostrophe are certainly rhetorical devices, but they're actually an interesting uh, thing. Free and direct style combines in one utterance two perspectives on, uh, you know, I say, two voices, <laughs> okay? It's the example that Voloshina and Bhaktin use for double, the double, double voicing, okay? Like, oh, it's hot in here, he said it to himself. One utterance, all right, you have the tense and the person of third-person narration but the indexical subjectivity of the first and the second person. It combines in one utterance um, that you separate in, with that clause, let's say, in the indirect discourse, uh, two perspectives on subjectivity. Apostrophe, as Barbara Johnson says, plays with the pronouns, the third person versus the first and second person. It's that you're addressing somebody who isn't there. You have to think about people that you see on the street that are engaged in, in, in uh, very, very aggressive arguments with themselves. <laughs> right, they're talking to themselves. Right, that, that's kind of what Lauren says is it allows you to hear things that you would normally never say <laughs> to yourself. As if you were addressing something, someone that wasn't there. It's also, as many of you know in literary theory at least, 
is the basic of the lyric poetry. So Barbara Johnson opens with Ode to the West Wind. Okay. But she actually analyzes, a brilliant analysis, Gwendolyn Brooks's uh, mother, which is addressed to her aborted children. Okay. And you can now see what apostrophe and free and direct style do is that they transform the first and second person and get a resonance of the third person. But the third person is the basis for omniscient narration, which moves in absolute time. That's exactly what Anderson is taking. But what the free and direct style does all right, is introduce subjectivity into the third person form. It was first introduced in Novelix's discourse all right, in, by Fulbert and Adam Over at the same time that Marx is writing the Universal. It has the same structure as the fetish, the full picture of the fetish. You treat people as third persons, even though they're real face to face. Okay. Um, you can begin to see then why Berlin uses apostrophe in free direct style as the bridge to subjectivity in this particular form, I can talk a little bit about Berlant and Demand and, and Barbara Johnson later. I mean, there are questions. As I said, Barbara Johnson really, uh, when you look at the articles that um, Lauren references, there are two articles, basically, animation, and the other one is free direct style, which is Barbara Johnson's analysis of Zora. Houston. Also relevant to this present moment. <laughs> so I would argue that by having a tropological twist, um, Lauren is able to take historical time into the historical present. And that the apostrophe in free and direct style actually open up this trouble of the space. There are two ends of the continuum. I argue that um, free and direct style is um, an example of the virtualization of grammar that um, Demand talks about. He talks about the last sentence in uh, among school school, school children um, by Yeats, uh, very grand sign. Can you tell the dan Can you know the dancer from the dance? That one end or is, can be read as a rhetorical question or a literal question. That's exactly what the three New York stuff does. Double words. Um, apostrophe is continuous conversation uh, that tropes, in some sense, uh, presuppose and create each other is exactly the organization of And um, uh, the man uses um, analysis of truth in his use of metaphor and metonymy in reading. Anyway, so that, that's... <laughs> That's the kind of outline of what I, you know, uh, present. And then I can, you know, uh, give you any questions and more specific, uh, uh, you know, arguments and, and material and all that. But I thought you would want to get an overview of, of the argument. Okay.
I think uh, we can we have time for a few questions. Uh, like we can we have some questions amongst us. So thank you. That was a great talk. It was obviously very complex. So I'm going to go back a little bit in your structure to when you were talking about time. Um, and I was thinking about two things. And one was, I think, sort of came out of your analysis in some ways of um, creations of, um, sorry, I'm going back in my notes. Um, so I'm sort of thinking about the way that you get mechanical time in Europe. You have this ability to precisely measure the hour, something which, as you've said, Needham shows that we know about in China from I mean, 3,000, at least two, whatever, 2,300 years right now, so we go back to. But that doesn't correspond with the sort of new development in China. Um, and so what I was interested in, in some ways, is how you get this sort of precision of time, um, and how then that's linked to military. But of course, it's then also linked, I think, and again, I'm just thinking of Greenwich, and the complexes of museums there, but to this sort of like naval imperialism, mm -hmm. right? And so I just thought that was maybe an interesting thing to think about. Does that work, or does it not? I mean, if we think about times, then, kind of allowing for also a different notion of space. So it's transforming not just the sense of time, but also a sense of space with the sort of ability to um, create this notion of longitude. And then that has all these effects. You know, the roots of this um, problem, um, Michael actually mentions this. Uh, it's a very complicated article on morphism and you know, reason a lot. Um, but he points out that Warf saw all this spatialization of time uh, in uh, SAE languages. Okay? Um, that's exactly what Bergson said. Bergson talks about the spatialization of time, but he does it through number. Anything that can be measured can be number. You know, yeah. Anything that can be counted can uh, introduce the spatialization. He was going after Kant. I mean, you know, uh, space, time, and causality is the accurate perception. Um, what Warf shows is, you know, it's in our metaphors. Because uh, you, you perceive objects, but you really can't perceive time. <laughs> I mean, uh, so we make an analogy from, uh, and we, we say, you know, tones are sharp, up and down, and all this kind of. We use physical reference to describe time, uh, and he says this is actually provided grammatically. I mean. Uh, it's not a matter of number, okay? So that's the, the, the gradient that you have to look at that you're talking about. I mean, and um, Michael suggests this in the um, way in which hours became measured against um, displacements, physical displacements, right? So uh, water, for instance, or uh, uh, sunlight. Uh, Dial things like that. I mean, um, and that's what you have to build on. Right now, second is defined not in terms of a, a angular displacement, but by the uh, rate of uh, radioactive decay of the cesium atom. <laughs> I mean, so that's that's the basis of the analogy. But that's the thing is. That I would want to look at the points where things shift, right? And that's, I, I think, you know, we haven't normally done that in, in, in you know, at least linguistic anthropology. 
And that was part of that structural linguistic you know, uh, tradition that Jakobsen and actually Greg knows this, Kurlovich, this great Polish linguist, they actually looked at these, all these, uh, they came up with laws of analogy based on uh, you know, surface phenomena and distributions in a Caesarean pattern. You know. And that's the kind of thing I would do because I think that it's not just point to point explanations. You won't almost want to explain a class. Right. And then you want to figure out why does something get focused on in that class? Like like the notion of stereotypes, you know, and all that. You know. Same same argument. Uh, I was wondering about the colony and the metropole in terms of defining what time is and how time operates. And uh, I was just like reading through your article, I thought it was very interesting to think of it in terms of Newtonian time and absolute time. And I was just wondering what the dynamics would be between the colony and the metropole in defining time and also like the adoption of a certain value of time in the colonies would not be a process that's generally very non-violent, I would say, that there is a violent uh, disciplining of the body in, in, in terms of time. I was just wondering how you see that dynamic to be working. I, you know, I imagine that there's reasonable anthropological uh, literature on that. I know a little bit about what happened in China because uh, most of China has been agricultural. I mean, until about 1950, it was 90% agricultural, uh, even by communist own statistics. And, that. and they run on uh, 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 so, uh, lunar calendars I mean, uh, and all that. Um, and uh, th there is an interesting uh, argument about forced. Uh, mechanization now in China, uh, and all these people that move from the villages to the cities, uh, uh, and of course, what they try to get is at least an elementary education for them. I mean, an elementary school education, um, and it, it it actually focuses on uh, things like timekeeping. I mean, exactly. It's actually, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen some text, textbooks and stuff like that. So there is a regimentation, and we forget because it's so natural to us. <laughs> uh, but that's not the way that most time systems work. I mean, and you know, all that. Uh, we we were just listening to a talk by Steve Feld where cicadas, uh, the humming of cicadas <laughs> indi indicated the seasons, I mean, and stuff like this. I mean, it was fascinating to me because you, you can pick any cyclic periodic phenomenon, right, and use it. I mean, usually you want to do, uh, you want to intersect it with something that's of significance uh, in your, semiotics of everyday life. And that's the, 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 the key, I mean, uh, is whether you have uh, in, a time and freedom, <laughs> let's say, to a actually adopt that, or whether you're forced. I mean, um, you know, and that, and that, that would be an interesting question. I mean, I know this is a lot of work. I mean, uh, but you, know, you can ask a question about a part of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just have a question. Thank you. Uh, is Perdon's notion of rhetoric in any way related to Sapir's notion of form feeling? Sir? Is Perdon's notion of rhetoric in any way related or can be explained to Sapir's notion of form feeling? Form feeling? Oh, yeah. No, I, I think that's exactly it. Actually, Andrew and I were talking about that today. I mean, uh, that, that, 
You see, Lauren wants to use this idea of interaction. In Cruel Optimism, she says, you, you really have to uh, uh, understand attachment uh, as um, an indirect phenomenon. We usually we talk about, think about affects right? So we kind of glom on to the object. Uh, what she wants to describe is that attachment always has another side to it. And that's, in some sense, the tension within a form feeling. I mean, you know, in other words, you know, it's not just a form feeling that a quality is kind of like a spread. You know, you know what I mean? It's a, a spread of intensities that comes to a form feeling. And that means it's actually a volatile phenomenon. Any notion of spread is going to be the part of the notion of volatility. So that's where I think that, um, I didn't mention this, uh, in a funny way, I think that Lauren is actually discovering volatility. That's really what her work is on. It's interesting that neoliberal finance, derivative finance, prices volatility. It doesn't price expected return. It doesn't price directional. It's the price is a spread. In other words, it's not what you do here, it's how much you swing back and forth. Right? And that notion of form feeling as a spread really has not been investigated. I know that, um, I, I know that uh, Brian Masumi is actually talking about it. I think Coppelsman is actually, in his book on intensity, is actually talking about that. There's something about like, uh, opening up intensity. In, in other words, you, you have a kind of point-to-point -point notion of intensity rather than a spread notion. Thank you so much. One of the things that um, was really compelling about this is the way in which you showed how for Wojtko Stone and for Lauren Berlant in particular, um, they show us a, a, a sort of political implication of rendering time uh, or, 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 or a political implication of the technologies for rendering time within time, time out of time, the sort of possibility of that in, in, in Western capitalism or but for you, in this present moment, where do you see linguistic anthropologists' investment lies in studying these types of phenomena? No, it's actually kind of been interesting for me to watch. You know, when I first started this project, it was really just a memorial essay. I knew three, three of them. They are all been associated with the center that Greg and I, you know, uh, had been at. And I, you know, was more or less doing a biographical, you know, uh, thing. And, and um, the present director of the center wanted uh, something on the website. <laughs> so, uh, but when I actually began to really read them uh, very closely, and I've been teaching all three of them all, over the years. So I, I was already familiar with their text, but I didn't teach them together, you know. Uh, and all of a sudden I saw all these kind of connections. And now, it, it makes sense because this linguistic turn was so huge uh, when all of them uh, were educated Moish kind of rejected it because he was a Marxist and all that. Uh, of course, Michael uh, embraced it because he was a student of Robinson and all that. And Lauren was traded Cornell, and so she was going to be exposed to this. But I began to realize that uh, because of reading Barbara Johnson, actually, the political implications of uh, what Lauren was doing, that you know, almost got the sense that Lauren was almost very political, but you didn't know what direction it was in. I mean, in the sense that it was progressive, but you didn't, you couldn't predict her position on any uh, thing at all. Um, 
And then I realized that that was the advantage because political uh, uh, action has to be in the present. It, it has to be attuned to the cadences and rhythms of the present. And that's exactly what uh, I know that uh, you know, uh, Katie and Lauren were trying to do in the hundreds, was basically one of describing these phenomena but that didn't fit any grammatical category at all. Uh, and that tropology opened up. Uh, it's almost like tropology uh, allowed you to create a narrative. Right? Um, uh, but you know, if you look at the, the, the hundreds, it, is, it, it, it also reads like a mess. I mean, you know, uh, so <laughs> you know, you're kind of, you're, you're kind of, so, so, and they meant that as a mess. They basically said some people will be inspired by it, and other people won't be. But you know, for the people who are inspired, that's great, you know? <laughs> because they won't get it from anywhere else. I mean, so that's the kind of thing that I think she's actually asking us to do is not to think out of, and that's why she really goes after decision making models. Decision making models are always weighing. The uh, risk and return, and all this kind of thing in the future, this kind of present, and all that. And she thinks that that's really the wrong way to think about policies. Uh, and especially when we take policy to ourselves, so these brilliant chapters on easy in, in the book uh, really are about don't self police yourself. I mean, they're really about trying to. Uh, to, to, to look at the phenomena in a slightly different way. I mean, uh, I also don't think that we have a very good flow vocabulary. We have one theory, uh, Chicks and Mahali, which is uh, clearly a neoliberal version of flow. And maybe you have another one in Bruce Lee. <laughs> I mean, you know, in uh, the kind of flexibility uh, martial arts kind of thing. But we really don't have the kind of resonance, volatility, uh, vocabulary yet. Uh, we, we've uh, absorbed that into finance and, and you know, uh, risk and return and volatility and stuff like that. So I think uh, Lauren was trying to explore that. I mean, and you see, the other thing that, uh, if you read her work, I didn't. Um, Notice this the first time. There's a lot of randomness that she's talking about. There's, there's like randomness, accidental uh, uh, encounters, and things like that. That's what you have to take advantage of. Um, and in a funny way, that's the politics. So there is a kind of, uh, that's what she means by cool optimism is really adaptive. It's not, it goes beyond indexicality, uh, but she also wants to generalize it. She wants to, to, to actually say, this situation, if I describe it right, might give you something that you can deal with in another situation. And that's not a subsumption of the situation underneath a category that extends to other phenomena, but rather an analogy. And I think that's all her stuff is about indirect, at least in cruel optimism. I mean, uh, you know, and so I've learned a lot from that because I saw exactly where Michael and Moish, I mean, I knew Moish quite well. So, I mean, you know, I talked with him all the time. And I, as Greg knows, we, we know his prejudices. <laughs> he, he hated the linguistic term, <laughs> I mean, you know. So you know, you, you couldn't talk with him that. Uh, but I think he, he would have liked Lauren, but he wouldn't understand her. I, I think we better end now. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this is great. Um, okay, and then for those of you.